There's 33 million small businesses in the U.S., and SoFi just this week launched a product to capture that new market. The CEO, Anthony Noto, made a post on X surrounding their approach, and it's very interesting because it's different than how we had thought about it initially. And in this video, I'm going to be talking about this along with other SoFi news we got this week, including non-permanent residents in SoFi Invest, including Galileo potentially losing a big client, including a huge web traffic spike in July, and also in ARK Invest selling out of their SoFi stock. Let's jump right into it. So I haven't done a weekly recap in a couple of weeks, but if you are new to the series, I recap SoFi news at the end of the week. So make sure to subscribe for more content of this type. Let's start off as always with the stock price action. SoFi is up around 10% over the past five days, and it hasn't closed off today as of this recording. It was about $6.65 before I hopped on. Now it's been a fairly wild ride this week because of that sudden market drop on Monday before the market opened. SoFi was actually in the $5 range. It opened just above the $6 range and it bounced back pretty strong. I think it closed the day green on Monday or if not green, very close to it. In fact, it was such a crazy day on Monday that many brokerages were also reportedly down. They were seeing outages. These were the large traditional brokerages, the likes of Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, Vanguard, Fidelity, E-Trade. All of them were having outages on Monday. I made a post on Next and I basically said SoFi Invest is going to see a big benefit from this because every time a traditional brokerage sees outages, you have outrage from the retail community. Everybody is pissed off because they're not able to buy. They're not able to sell. All that does is it provides the best advertisement you could possibly have for two things. Number one, for SoFi Invest, for somebody in the retail community to essentially diversify their brokerages or open a new brokerage account with SoFi or transfer everything over to SoFi so as to not get further outages. And number two, for Galileo, because it highlights the need for many of these traditional institutions to move to a more modern tech architecture so as to avoid future outages. And so on both of those counts, it's beneficial for SoFi when all of these other brokerages are having outages. Now, funny enough, after the market closed on Monday, we got news that ARCF had sold about 300,000 shares of SoFi earlier in the day. We've talked in the past about Kathy Wood accumulating SoFi shares and ARC eventually becoming in the top 10 institutional holders for SoFi. So it was really surprising actually to see them sell a relatively sizable chunk of their position. And just from the trading summary, they were buying Amazon, Coinbase, and Robinhood throughout that day with those proceeds. Now, if you were to ask me, what do I think of this move? Well, not too much, to be honest. I monitored ARC funds throughout the week and there was no other selling. It was just on Monday. You know, a lot of their moves don't really make sense to me in terms of what they buy and sell on a daily basis. So I'm not quite sure what to think of this particularly, especially because ARK has bought SoFi much higher than what it was trading out on Monday. I mean, they bought in the $8 range, $9 range. So chances are they were rotating out just due to the chaos because SoFi was maintaining some strength and they were putting that money into other positions. Do I agree with that? Not really. But I mean, it kind of makes sense when you look at it from that lens because SoFi was very strong. I think they actually might even close the day green on Monday, whereas Robinhood, as an example, is down like 17%. And so they might have been rotating to some of those positions, but I honestly don't know. Moving on in the week, on Tuesday, Tanner posted around the five-year deal that Marquetta had signed with Vero Bank, speculating that Galileo had lost yet another big client to the tune of 5 million accounts and wondering whether this could be the case for the reduced guidance in Galileo that we got a couple of weeks ago on the Q2 earnings call. Now, the cool thing here is that he was contacted by the CEO, Anthony Noto, who confirmed that Vero has not been with Galileo since before 2023 and that they left to pursue their banking license with another provider. And since that time, with the acquisition of Technicis, this problem has been solved. Anthony Noto commented further on this thread saying that Vero had made the decision before getting the OCC bank license approval. When we were buying Galileo during the diligence period in March 2020, before we signed the Galileo acquisition agreement, we were told that Vero was planning to move off of Galileo if it received approval for its bank license and that the Vero application included the commitment to make the change as well as who they were moving their core and processing to. I was personally told that they had to make the change if they wanted to get approval for the license. I was told that both by Galileo and Vero, Vero received OCC approval of the bank license in July of 2020. After the Galileo acquisition closed in April 2020, it took Vero until Q2 of 2022 to largely move off of Galileo. 
So I have a couple of thoughts here. First, I love that Anthony Noto is willing to reply to shed more light on these particular issues. Many CEOs wouldn't even interact with a post like that. Even fewer would provide that level of detail that he provided. Secondly, I think it speaks to the level of effort for many of these institutions like Vero Bank to move off of Galileo. In the case of Vero, it took them over two years to fully move off of Galileo. And this could be seen both as a barrier, but also as a beneficial aspect. Because on one hand, it'll take a much longer period of time to sign a new client. This is why, I mean, we've been talking about Galileo new accounts for years now, and a lot of them are going through this process. Like if we know that it takes Vero two years to offboard off of Galileo, it's gonna take another person two years to onboard onto Galileo as well. So there's a high effort to sign every new client. Now, on the other hand, the benefit here is the high switching costs will really help the lifetime value because once you acquire that client, it's really difficult for them to move off and they have to make a really strong commitment to do so. Otherwise, they'll just stay put because of that high switching cost that's associated. And finally, the other thought here is that it speaks to the importance of technicists in the Galileo stack and the overall progression of Galileo's product offerings over that time. Galileo is getting much better in a much shorter amount of time than it takes for them to sign a new client, if that makes sense. So for example, if a client agreed to come on to Galileo in 2022, they might not be fully onboarded until 2024. But in that two-year period between 2022 and 2024, Galileo has consistently introduced new product offerings. And so they're moving at light speed relative to the amount of time it takes to bring on these new clients. Now, moving on, since we're still on Tuesday, after the bell upstart reported earnings, the stock shot up 50% before giving back some of those gains on Wednesday. They reported a 6% decline in revenue and a negative $54 million in net income, yet the stock saw this dramatic rise. Why? Well, upstart has a low float and it has double the short interest compared to SoFi. So a better than expected result, even though it's kind of a mediocre result, to be honest. And while that's interesting, it's really not relevant to SoFi because SoFi has detached themselves from Upstart because they've proven themselves to be on a fundamental basis, not only profitable, but also at a higher growth rate than Upstart. And yet it trades at a lower valuation. And this, I think, is a core problem with many of us invested in SoFi stock, myself included, that find it incredibly frustrating when a company like Upstart blows up 50% on mediocre earnings, whereas SoFi reports spectacular earnings and is flat. And while we're on that note, it also over time amplifies to form this discrepancy between how the street and how retail communities see this stock. And I found this interesting, uh, highlighted on a post on Reddit on Wednesday, showing the discrepancy between these two groups and how they view SoFi. Wall Street scores SoFi a three stars out of five stars, while seeking alpha analysts, most of whom are retail investors themselves, the likes of Stephen Fiorello and others, on average, view the company 4.6 stars out of five, a drastically different score highlighting a pretty big spread in the discrepancy of whether this is a good or a bad company. Moving on now to Wednesday, we learned of SoFi Invest being now available for non-permanent residents who are residing in the US. So while it's not quite available in Canada just yet, there's quite a few individuals who are non-permanent residents living in the US who can now have access to SoFi Invest. And while this is obviously a positive, it widens the addressable market. I made a post about this saying that, you know, the positive here in my eyes is really from a brand values point of view, because they can push this idea to everybody to be able to get their money right. And it aligns with their value proposition. It aligns with their core message as a business. But really, when you crank the numbers, SoFi has over 9 million members. They're barely scratching the surface of the eligible population. I mean, there's 340 million people in the US. If we only say, okay, only permanent residents in the US, and then only permanent residents aged 18 to 55, and then only permanent residents 18 to 55 who are actually you know, aware of this offering and want something new that's not a traditional player, it still allows for several multiples of SoFi's existing member base. And so having it available to non-permanent residents, I don't think is likely going to make a huge dent in the overall scheme of things of their member counts. I mean, we're not going to see like a massive member addition just because of non-permanent residents on SoFi Invest. But I do think it's a good advertisement for the business overall and just directionally speaking, a good direction for them to move in. And now moving on to the biggest news this week, SoFi will be offering business banking and financing options through partnerships to better serve entrepreneurs. Anthony Noto, the CEO, posted about this on Thursday, saying that there's 33 million small businesses in the U.S. And for those just getting started, 
and also those already up and running, SoFi is now offering financing options in the form of small business lending. And on the SoFi Weekly Podcast, we've been advocating for small business lending for a while now. And the reason why is because it has the opportunity to really amplify SoFi's business. However, the way that they're going about this has sparked a conversation. This is because they're launching this through partnerships and not building it in-house. And yes, SoFi is no stranger to partnerships. We know that with insurance and with other business lines, they've done it through partnerships and they're just collecting a referral bonus. And if we just look at the screenshot here, we can see that they're partnering with Novo and American Express for business checking. The disclaimer here at the bottom of the screenshot highlights that SoFi will be paid a fee from the providers if the user converts through the SoFi marketplace. So basically they're getting a referral bonus. Now, if we flip over to the next screenshot highlighting financing options, we can see that SoFi does not provide small business loans themselves, but they just connect clients to the end third parties through the marketplace. Now, the types of small business loans are listed here, as well as the providers at the bottom. A few things to keep in mind, this is all referral based. So SoFi will only get the money if an applicant is successfully converted to that third party, but the application process and the eligibility will be done by the third party. So that assessment is out of SoFi's hands. There's a couple of pros and cons going with this route. So first of all, just reading the top comment here, it's from Chris Hager who highlights the need to build business banking and lending in-house so as to be more vertically integrated. I don't disagree with this because I do believe that the vertical integration across many different aspects of this business will be their unique differentiator because it'll provide them the flexibility to have more lucrative rewards for their end users. So for example, just look at what the bank charter did with regards to APYs, look at what Galileo provides with regards to the flexibility of their tech stack. There's obvious benefits to vertical integration for SoFi's business, especially when you're passing down those rewards to their end users, you can have a competitive advantage from a user perspective in the market. And not only that, but it's also more profitable for you because you keep people in your ecosystem. For example, in my previous video, I talked about credit cards and I advocated for how credit cards as part of that overarching ecosystem is crucial to the main value proposition of the business because the cross-selling flywheel becomes so much stronger with each new product that you introduce. Now, of course, the drawbacks of building this in-house is that it would take a longer amount of time, a higher amount of effort, and it would be more costly to set up and to scale. They would be doing all the heavy lifting themselves and in-house. So the partnership route is lower effort and it's lower or financial reward and it doesn't really help with the SoFi flywheel because you're essentially referring a user out of your ecosystem to somebody else's. Of course, one of the main benefits of the partnership route is that SoFi can partner with more established brands to get quickly up and running in minimal amount of time because their main contribution to this partnership is just the marketplace and the actual applications are handled by the third party. Now, I think that it could also be the case that they start off with a partnership to gauge the interest and gather more information and eventually make a plan to vertically integrate that business segment in-house at a future date. This playbook, I think, is fairly common across many different industries. The first one that came into my mind was Amazon, which is also a marketplace, right? They were the marketplace between third-party vendors and the end users. And after they gathered all of that information on the best-selling products, they introduced their own in-house Amazon product line which they're also selling through their marketplace. It's different in SoFi's case, but the analogy I think still holds. It could very well be the case that SoFi is doing the same thing with business lending. There's nothing stopping them from in the future vertically integrating small business loans as well as insurance and the other product offerings that they're currently getting a referral bonus from. In fact, you could play the devil's advocate and make an argument that launching through a partnership is a very low effort way to gather data on how big of an impact this would make, how much demand is there actually out there for us to make the leap and take the risk to vertically integrate this in-house. Finally, on Thursday, we also got web traffic for July, and we're seeing a record in terms of the web traffic here. This is all preliminary. It's all early days, but I'm confident that when you amplify this out, Q3 is going to end up being a huge quarter for member editions, possibly their biggest ever member edition quarter. And so far, in the first few weeks of Q3, we've had several mega announcements. We've had the non-permanent residents, we've had two new credit cards, we've had a subscription for SoFi members, and we've also had the small business loans through this partnership. And this is a lot of news, right? When you compare it with what we were getting in Q2, there was relatively nothing to speak about. I bought more SoFi this week in the mid $6 range. I feel pretty good about it. I'm fairly overweight SoFi, but I think if it stays in this range for a long period of time, I'm just going to keep buying a DCA. Thanks so much for watching and tune in tonight to the SoFi Weekly Podcast at 10 p.m. Eastern on this channel. If you enjoyed this content, subscribe for more and I'll see you in the next one.